we'll turn into something a little more serious. Back in 2007, when you had that DQ in the Classic, if that's affected the way you fish today? It, it doesn't affect uh, the DQ in 07. It doesn't affect how I fish this, this right now. Uh, did it affect me uh, afterwards? Heck yeah, man. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a bogus call, and I thought it was unfair, and I thought that ESPN was just wanting media, and they got it. Uh, it's not written in the rules. It was a judgment call. So yeah, there for a while, I stayed a little bitter about it, but put that stuff behind you. Doesn't change how I fish now, man. I'm strictly fish for the goals I have set. And I'm not motivated by anger, uh, any of that stuff. I kind of let that stuff go. So Gerald, KY Bass 1276. He asks, he wants to know your thoughts and advantages and disadvantages that anglers face uh, fishing the classic being that it's the first event of the year. Um, specifically, he wants to know how you prepare yourself after being off for a couple of months. Well, really most of the guys will come back and fish some prior to the classic locally. The big, I mean, so the fishing and getting back in the swing of things, that's not. That's not that big a deal because most of them kind of have a spring training. They'll leave home a week early and go fish every day and get back into the groove. But the biggest disadvantage is getting all this in order, uh, wrapping boats and trucks and motors and getting stuff in. I mean, it was a day and a half before the Classic and my boat and truck was completely disassembled in my basement and they were wrapping it. So biggest disadvantage is trying to get all the loose ends tied up before the tournament, but as far as Mechanically and all that, so that's not that big a deal. Kind of like riding a bike, huh? Kind of like riding a bike. Once you get back in there, you're in there. Zell, Zell poses an interesting question here. He says, uh, in the old days of the Bassmaster Classic, contenders were only allowed 10 pounds of tackle and four rods. What would you do if the night before the Classic Tournament officials notified everyone that they were once again implementing this rule. Well, I'd probably take a spinning rod so I could throw a drop shot or shaking head. I'd take one cranking rod, one flipping rod, and one, one rod to cast a jig with. So I could take a seven footer to jig with, a seven foot medium to crank, six six medium heavy spinning rod to work with and 7-2 flipping stick, I could probably get through with the whole deal, man. And, you know, just downsize. God had to fish the baits I've got confidence in and my strength, which would probably be jigging and stuff like that. So if I decided to do it, it'd be kind of kinky, but just go with the baits you know you can do, you're can you the best with. And with 10 pounds of tackle, would that be primarily plastics or jigs? Or? Uh, prob probably, probably half and half. I'd probably have a couple of pounds of crankbaits, a couple of pounds of jigs, and the rest of it in plastics. Well, Larry Sullivan has an interest, interesting question here. He wants to know, how has this recession changed the way you do things, and do you fear for the fishing industry? The recession has changed things. Uh, changed the way I do things a little bit, simply because I don't, uh, you know, I wasn't a big pre-fishing in the beginning, but I don't do as much of that as I normally would because of the cost of the fuel and hotels and people losing sponsorship. Uh, you're just not as frivolous. You don't buy extra tackle. You don't, I mean, you shop around hotel rooms. You stay more guys to a room. Uh, plan your trips out a lot better. So, I mean, that part you have to adjust to. But I do fear some for the industry. People are still fishing. A lot of people still buying fishing licenses. Unfortunately, a lot of people ain't buying boats and trucks, and that's that's what we need to keep the economy going. So there's a little bit of fear there. Do you think things are gonna get on the upswing here real quick? Or? I don't think so, man. I think we're another year out before we see anything really change. Another year. Angling Adam wants to know your favorite deep water tactic for northern lakes on the tour. Uh, probably drop shot, man. I mean, when I go north and you know you end up fishing deep, it's just hard to beat drop shot. And looking at them, you know, that just seems to be the best way to catch them, and always has been. So, drop shot, drop shot, and a drop shot. You have a specific bait you like to use? Uh, you know, I think I don't think you can go wrong with the Zoom Green Pumpkin finesse. You know, I take it anywhere up there and catch them. I mean, you can try anything, but that. 
that particular one's going to work day in and day out everywhere you go. So, green pumpkin finesse, quarter ounce weight, Us <coughs> usually six or eight pound line. So here's another one, a Grizzly1654, he writes in, what advice would you give someone who grew up bang uh, banging the baits, the banks, and is ready to move away from the bank and learn how to fish deep water structure? Uh, biggest thing I'd probably tell you the, is learn to read your electronics. Study, study that stuff hard at home. You know, read every manual and get you a quality depth finder. And uh, that's a, a much more efficient tool, fishing deep. It'll save you a lot of trouble. But you can learn a lot of that by looking at some of the information that they have to offer, whether it's an owner's manual or, or your dealer teaching you settings. But depth finder, depth finder, depth finder to move off the bank. Now here's a really interesting uh, hypothetical question. London Explorer, he writes in, I'd like to see a detailed plan of how you would design two different boats. How would you equip them out? from scratch. One boat would be fully rigged with no expense spared at all and the other one would be an entry-level boat for guys just starting out. How would you go about doing that? Mm. I'd say my high-end boat would be, a tw you know, I'd probably go with a Triton a 21X3. Uh, I would put heated seats in it, be the number one design. Uh, heated seats much like in your car. They ran off solar pattern, solar power. They got it from one of these lids, so it never ran down your batteries. You could just flip a switch and warm your seat as you ran. Uh, nice built-in stereo. I'd like to be able to uh, run about a 200-pound thrust trolling motor. You know, so I'd have to reinforce the front nose for the rip and the turn of the trolling motor. Uh, probably go with like a Mercury 250 XS, something pretty strong, fast. Uh, maybe a little midget stripper pole or something and go in right here, just a little chrome one <laughs> on those tough derbies. <laughs> that would be my biggest thing I've always wanted was design heated seats, you know. Uh, I would like lights in the live well, so when you're fishing at night and stuff like that, you could kick on the lights and see down in the live well. That would be my fancy one. My entry level would be a, a straight 18 and a half foot fiberglass triton. I'd uh, build it out of the same type of hole as this right here, the same design to get the speed. Wouldn't have very much in it. I'd have a flasher back there and a, and a small like an X28 or something up front. Wouldn't get crazy on the depth finder. Uh, I have me about a 10 inch jack plate manual. Keep the price down. I'd set it up to run. I'd have most of the storage shifted to the back and not the front so you wouldn't overstore it in the front and weight it down. I'd paint it black and white, generic. Just a straight black and white, mean boat. There's my two boats. Lund Explorer also wants to know what new technology do you think has made a positive impact on the sport? Positive impact, you know, I don't know. I think so, so, probably the oxygenator, uh, all these live well systems that they're getting, well, they got all this extra way to keep them alive. I think stuff like that's probably made a, a po more positive impact than what people realize simply because it helps keep the fish alive, you know, and that's what we're out here to catch is catch and release, catch and release. So with more technology going into live wells, I think it's a, uh, probably overlook, but it does make a difference. And following up on that, Pitching Kid wants to know what you think is going to be the next technological breakthrough in bass fishing. I don't know. They're getting so fancy with it, man. I guess they're going to hire us to get some kind of dog train, bring him out here and let him point fish. I mean, they've got all these fancy depth finder, side scan, eagle scan, mount scan, but, you know, I don't know. I was hoping that you would see somebody come out with a better weather system for the boats where you can pull up on a screen is what I look to be coming. Uh, you just pull the weather channel up and read the weather and wind direction would be pretty nice. That's, that's what I predict is going to happen. 